Hey everybody, welcome back to Hands On Books. Um, it's been too long since we did one of these and I just got a book in that I really want to open. So we decided to film an episode. Usually uh, we pick from random at a, from a stack of used books and uh, just sort of document the experience of opening them. But this time it's a little bit different because I know what this book is ahead of time and it's not used. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you. This is Empires of the Steppe by Kenneth W. Harl, a history of the nomadic tribes who shaped civilization. And I wanted to get this because I'm writing something that um, I need to do research about step cultures for. So, and well, let's see what if we can figure out what this cover art is. Yeah, this is a brand new book, so it's copyright 2023. To my wife, Sema, ever patient and ever loving. And then what looks like Turkish, which I'm not going to attempt. Okay, the cover image is a Mongol horseman with a composite bow, circa 13th century, from Jerry Ward. Bridgman Images. And yeah, you see the horsemen doing the classic like Parthian shot thing where they're so good at riding the horses that they can shoot backwards at a full gallop accurately. Let's read uh, Kenneth W. Harrell's biography here. Kenneth W. Harrell is Professor Emeritus of Classical and Byzantine History at Tulane University, New Orleans. He is one of the world's foremost experts on steppes civilizations, Roman history and numismatics, and has written extensively on Greek, Roman, Byzantine, and Viking culture. Empires of the Steppes will be his first full-length narrative history book for the trade. Let's go ahead and read this. The barbarian nomads of the Eurasian steppes have played a decisive role in world history, but their achievements have gone largely unnoticed. These nomadic tribes have produced some of the world's greatest conquerors, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, and Tamerlane, among others. Their deeds still resonate today. Indeed, these nomads built long-lasting empires, facilitated the first global trade of the Silk Road, and disseminated religions, technology, knowledge, and goods of every description that enriched and changed the lives of so many people, so many across Europe, China, and the Middle East. From a single region emerged a great many peoples. The Huns, the Mongols, the Magyars, the Turks, the Xiongnu, the Scythians, the Goths, all of whom went on to profoundly and irrevocably shape the modern world. In this new comprehensive history, Professor Kenneth W. Harl vividly recreates the lives and world of these often forgotten peoples from their beginnings to the early modern age. Their brutal struggle to survive on the steppes bred a resilient, pragmatic people ever ready to learn from their more advanced neighbors. In warfare, they dominated the battlefield for over 1,500 years. Under charismatic rulers, they could topple empires and win their own. Yeah, the step, the step people have always been so, so interesting. Like, they just periodically burst the bounds of the step at, and conquer the entire world, like every few hundred years, that's what it seems like. So also by Kenneth W. Harrell, Civic Coins and Civic Politics in the Roman East, A.D. 180 to 275, and Coinage in Roman Economy, 300 B.C. to A.D. 700. 
So going through the table of contents here, there looks like there's a bunch of, you know, like I knew there would be, there's, there's a bunch of interesting um, civilizations that he covers. Um, I'm mainly interested in learning about their religions, maybe some mythology and like the origin story of the um, conquerors. So got general stuff about the Eurasian steppe. Then they, we start with the Scythians and Alexander the Great, Modu Chanyu, which I've never heard of. The Xiongnu, which are like the original Huns. Um, Sons of Heaven, don't know what that is. The Parthians, heirs of the Xiongnu, the Northern Way, the Hephthalites, the White Huns, right? Attila, Turks. Then the Seljuk Turks. Prester John. And then we have Genghis Khan, um, Batu, which I've never heard of, Kublai Khan, and Tamerlane. So I'm really interested in um, maybe some sort of like cool rags to riches stories of one of these guys who begins as maybe an outlaw. Um, like, actually, I have it right here. Um, Nadir Shah, who is not as not necessarily a step guy, but but he has this great origin story where he was like um, his father died at a really young age, and then his mother it was really difficult to raise him because they had like no income, and I think they were both enslaved at one point, and then he somehow escapes slavery, and then comes to lead a band of bandits, and then eventually topples the Safavid Empire of Iran and then takes over the entire Persian Empire and then attacks India and like dominates the Delhi Sultan and just becomes this in, in amazing story and then he like goes crazy and like builds pyramids of people's heads but um so it's a really interesting story and I'm hoping to find more stories like that in this book in the sort of backgrounds of the protagonists if you want to call them that i think i just want to read the first page of the first chapter not the prologue just to get a taste of harl's writing style chapter one the peopling of the eurasian steppes sir arl stein the indefatigable british linguist archaeologist and explorer led four expeditions into Central Asia between 1900 and 1930. There, in the buried caravan cities and caves of the Tarim Basin, Stein found troves of Buddhist and Manichaean documents between the 4th and 8th centuries AD, as well as mummies remarkably well preserved due to the dry climate. The documents have illuminated the spiritual and commercial world of the Silk Road. Among the languages were Sanskrit, Prakrit, Saka, an Eastern Iranian dialect, Sogdian, another Eastern Iranian dialect that was the lingua franca of the Silk Road, Tibetan, Tangut, Chinese, and a previously unknown language family that scholars have since dubbed Tokarian. The so-called Tarim mummies, dating from between 2000 and 300 BC, have shattered previous notions about the history of Central Asia. Subjected to DNA analysis, the mummies have now revealed to the dismay of both Uyghur and Chinese nationalists that the first inhabitants of the cities of the Tarim Basin were neither Turks nor Chinese. Instead, testing since 2008 confirms that the first inhabitants shared DNA with today's European populations, while later immigrants from the Middle East and Northern India arrived and intermarried with this indigenous population. Mummies of individuals with Mongolian features only date from the end of the first millennium BC. These scientific findings offer little comfort to Chinese or Uyghur nationalists today seeking historical justifications to claim Xinjiang or Uyghurstan as their homeland. Sorry about that pronunciation. Instead, they confirm that Stein's discoveries of the manuscripts and mummies forever altered our understanding of the origins of the Indo-European languages and the origins of the steppe nomads of Eurasia. But I think that's enough of the first chapter. Let me see if there's a specific topic I want to check out. Um, yeah, actually, I'll just do Tamerlane, Prince of Destruction. That sounds great. 
Let me see if at the beginning of this chapter there may be some like origin story for Tamerlane. 387. In 1336, Timur was born to Taragai, a lesser emir of the Turkish-speaking tribes comprising the Barla's confederation, and his consort, Takina Khatun. His parents pitched their tents on the grasslands of Mawaranar, or Transoxiana, near the city of Kesh, today Shavrizabz, 50 miles southeast of Samarkand, which was then in the Chagatai Khanate. Timur later favored Kesh as his place of birth, constructing a magnificent palace, Aksaray, White Palace, or Aksaray, and complexes of mosques and madrasas. Modern Shahrizabz, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, attracts thousands of tourists each year to see Tamerlane's birthplace. The Uzbeks have erected a monumental bronze statue of their national hero Tamerlane amid the ruins of Aksaray, to greet the visitors. Well, that's not really the sort of background that I would want to check out. Let me see. Here we go. Tugluk, Timur, imposed himself as Khan over the tribes. So some other dude. In 1360, he exploited the political confusion of the Western Khanate and invaded Mawa Mawaranar Har. <laughs> Mawaranar. Mawaranar. And captured Samarkand. Tamerlane, then age 24, promptly submitted to Tugluk Timur, who deposed Haji Bey and appointed Tamerlane emir of the Barlas tribes. In 1360, Tamerlane had already established his reputation as a warrior in the seasonal raids and retaliatory attacks of nomadic warfare. As emir of the Barlas tribes, Tamerlane drilled his warriors to the standards of the horsemen of Genghis Khan and extended his sway over the tribes of Mawaranahar. He made common cause with Hussein, the son of Abdullah ibn Kazagan, an emir of the Kara'unas. Tamerlane and Hussein, sworn brothers since their youth, shared a friendship comparable to that of Timujin and Jamuka. Tamerlane married Aljaz Turkan Aga, sister of Hussein, but her early death contributed to the waning of the friendship between the two men. Together, Tamerlane and Hussein raided the camps of rival tribes and lent their swords to the overlord Tugluk Timur. Khan of Mogulistan, or to lesser rulers of Mawaranar and Iran. In 1362, while in the mercenary service of the Emir of Sistan, Timur sustained a wound from an arrow to his right hip, and when the bones knitted, his hip and femur fused so that he walked thereafter with a pronounced limp, dragging his right leg. He also sustained an arrow wound in his right hand. He must have battled pain throughout his life, Yet Tamerlane never failed to fight in the forefront of his warriors due to his injuries, and if anything, his followers, his followers viewed his deformity as proof of their lord's courage. I'm more looking for like the initial rise, but I guess it seems like Tamerlane was uh, sort of born into at least like minor royalty. Oh, let me see how it smells. Even though it's new, I know it's not gonna not gonna be up to my exacting standards, but still, new books can new books smell good too. Yeah, it's always nice to get a brand new hardback. I like used books so much that I hardly ever buy a a new book, but it is nice. Let me see if there's some cool maps in here. Doesn't really look like it, actually. This guy is a no maps kind of guy. All right. Okay. All right, I'm back after reading some of Empires of the Steps. I read the first chapter and flipped around to some of the various other ones um, to try to find a cool origin story. And I didn't really want to read Genghis Khan's because it's pretty well known. So I think I'm going to, well, first of all, I did, I like this book so far. And the first chapter that I read is just a really comprehensive, like crash course on the current up to date scholarship, I guess, on the history of the Indo-Europeans generally. 
and how that sort of um, dovetails with the steps. So instead of reading another excerpt from here, I'm going to read um, part of the book that I talked about earlier, um, the biography by Michael Axworthy of Nader Shah. And he has this incredible origin story, so I figured, um, why not? I might never get a chance to record anything about Nader Shah. So let's give this a shot. So we have this depiction of a party of Turkmen slavers with their captives. In this case, the captives are Turkmen from another tribe. This is a 19th century engraving, but with bows rather than muskets, the raiders would have looked little different a century earlier. Note the writing style, still to be seen in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Hand on hip, firm seat in the trot redolent of ruthless arrogance. See the hands on the hips here. The captives. So this is from chapter one, the fall of the Safavid dynasty. And it starts with this poem from Marlowe. Unhappy Persia, that in former age hast been the seat of mighty conquerors, that in their prowess and their policies have triumphed over Africa and the bounds of Europe, where the sun dares scarce appear for freezing meteors and congealed cold, now to be ruled and governed by a man at whose birthday Cynthia with Saturn joined, and Jove, the sun, and Mercury denied to shed their influence in his fickle brain. Now Turks and Tartars shake their swords at thee, meaning to mangle all thy provinces. The future conqueror of Delhi was born in a wild and dangerous region on the northeastern frontier of Persia, the northern part of the province of Khorasan, far from the splendor of royal courts and palaces. There is some uncertainty about where Nader was born, but the likeliest date is the 6th of August, 1698. His father was of lowly but respectable status, a herdsman of the Afshar tribe, said also to have been a camel driver and a maker of sheepskin coats. His name was Imam Kohli. In comparison with many of the great nobles among which he later moved, Nadir's birth was obscure. But in the local context of northern Khorasan, his father may have had some status among the Afshars as a village headman. Nader's official historian, making no attempt to elevate his birth, wrote of his origins that the sword takes its merit from the natural strength of its temper, not from the mine from which its iron was taken. The Karaklu Afshars, to whom Nader's father belonged, were a semi-nomadic Turkoman tribe settled in Khorasan, in northeastern Persia. Nader was born at Dast Gerd, a fortified village on the northern side of the Allahu Akbar mountains of the Dara Ghaz region, northwest of Mashhad, the capital of Khorasan. At birth, he was named Nader Kohli, which means slave of the wonderful, a way of piously dedicating the child to the service of God. When years later, Imam Kohli's son made himself Shah, he changed his name to Nader, meaning rarity or prodigy. It is possible that this had been a nickname earlier, as the growing boy showed his uncommon abilities. I'm going to skip ahead here. Nader grew up in this paradoxical tradition, a Persian subject speaking a Turkic language familiar with an urbanized Persian culture that was understood and revered from Istanbul to Samarkand, Delhi and beyond yet an uncomfortable outsider in cities, disdainful of city dwellers who could not ride a horse. The life of Nader's family would have followed this ancient rhythm of moving the fat-tailed sheep, which to Western eyes looked more like small, dark goats, and other livestock to the cooler upland pastures around Kobkan in the spring as the snows melted and the first flush of new growth appeared, and back to the milder winter climate of Dastgerd in the autumn. Having waited a long time for the birth of a son, Imam Kohli was affectionate towards Nader and proud of him. 
In later years, perhaps remembering the early, happy phase of his childhood, Nader himself was a doting father, perhaps too indulgent, as Imam Kohli had been. Even at the age of 10, Nader was said to have been a good horseman, hunter and racer of horses, skilled with the bow and the javelin. One of his early biographers, following the conventions common to lives of heroes in Persian literature, stressed his precociousness, saying that when Nader was one, he seemed like a three-year-old, and at the age of 10, riding his horse, he went hunting lions, panthers, and boars. There's a footnote here. A good parallel appears in Ferdowsi's Shahnameh, in his account of the childhood of Sohrab. Quote, in but a single month he'd grown a year. His chest was like Rostam's, the son of Zal. At three he learned the game of polo, and at five he mastered bow and javelin. Another story says that when he played with other children, he called himself the king and let the others rule smaller parts of his kingdom. On one occasion he made these princelings fight each other, and in the end, if there was a winner, he gave his clothes to that child and returned home naked. When his mother saw him, she was angry, and he ran to his father to escape her. His father took Nader home and told his mother to let the child do what he wanted. Nader's father died when Nader was still quite young, precipitating the family into friendless poverty. The years that followed were hard. It is significant for Nader's later sympathetic conduct toward women that he saw his mother struggling as a poor widow, in a society in which a woman without male protection was highly vulnerable. Destitute and with two young sons, it would have been difficult to remarry, and some in these circumstances would have moved to the nearest city and slipped into prostitution for want of other options. Nader's mother must have been a tough and strong-minded woman. The boy must have missed Imam Kohli terribly. He grew up poor and insecure, open to jibes and sneers for his lack of a father. One might think, according to the usual wisdom in these matters, that he would have been crippled by such an experience and lost his self-confidence. But different experiences draw out different responses in different people. In Nader's case, adversity strengthened his will to survive, stimulated the restless urge to assert himself, to challenge and overcome adverse circumstances, to take control and dominate others. His response to humiliation was a burning resolve to prove himself better than his tormentors. These hard early experiences must also have fostered a dislike of people who were soft, who had achieved status too easily, including perhaps the mullahs. He never forgot the hardships of his early years, nor his bonds with those who had shared them, especially his mother and his brother Ibrahim. Nor did he try to conceal his early life of poverty. One story says that when his father died, he and his mother were so poor that he had to support them by gathering firewood in the hills, taking them to market on an ass and a camel that they could barely feed. Years later, he conferred an honor on a man that had been a companion at this time with the words, Do not grow proud, but remember the ass and the picking of sticks. If some of his earliest memories included his feeling special for his intelligence and his natural dominance over other children, and for the way his father had doted on him, his later childhood marked him in a more negative way, as a social misfit and outcast. One way or another, he remained an outsider the rest of his life. Beyond the seasonal migrations, life was unpredictable. There is a story that Nader and his mother were carried off into slavery by Turkmen raiders when he was still young. Another version suggests that he was captured with some companions by the Turkmen, but prayed for release, whereupon his fetters fell away, quote, like cobwebs. He freed his friends and carried off the raiders' loot. This has been interpreted as a mythologized version of an episode in which Nader persuaded his captors to release him in exchange for a promise of future cooperation an early showing of his ability to manipulate unpromising circumstances to his advantage. Whatever the truth of it, the stories depict the sort of dangerous world in which a young boy grows up fast. Around the age of 15, Nader went into the service of one of the tribal leaders who represented what passed for government authority in the region. This was Baba Ali Beg Kusa Ahmadlu, the governor of the town of Abavard, 
an important chief among the offshars of Khorasan. There had probably been some kind of connection between Baba Ali and Nadir's father. Nadir started as an ordinary musketeer, but eventually rose in Baba Ali's service to become his right-hand man. And there's a footnote here. The other word for musketeer is tofangchi. Baba Ali Beg's musketeers were not necessarily foot soldiers. It is likely that they were mounted on horses, mules, or camels to deal with the fast-moving Turkmen. The javelin and bow he had learned to use in the Daragaz Valley were still significant traditional weapons in tribal life and in hunting, but even in the remote northeast of Persia, the former was obsolete and the latter had been made obsolescent in warfare by the spread of gunpowder firearms. In learning to use a smooth-bore musket, Nader was learning the dangerous trade of modern warfare. The experience taught him the relatively unexplored potential of these weapons, through the exploitation of which he was eventually to revolutionize the practice of warfare in Persia and the surrounding region. But those days were as yet far off. As Nadir made his mark among the troops of the governor of Abavard, his main responsibility would have been to pursue raiders and retrieve their loot, whether portable property, animals, or human beings. No doubt there was uncertainty in many cases about what belonged to whom, and it is likely that Nadir profited from such gray areas. It is easy to see how later, hostile stories of his having been himself a bandit and robber could have originated. Around the year 1714-1715, a larger-than-normal raid by Turkmen of the Yomut tribe broke into northern Khorasan, several thousand strong. Baba Ali's frontier force fought the Turkmen successfully, defeated them, and captured 1,400 of the raiders. Nader must have distinguished himself in the fighting, because Baba Ali chose him to take the news of the victory to the Shah in the capital, Isfahan. In Isfahan, Nader was presented to Shah Sultan Hussein and rewarded with a present of a hundred tomans, worth just under 190 pounds sterling at the time, riches for a young man from Nader's background, says the footnote. This was Nader's first visit to Isfahan, an encounter with a different world. Today, the Maidan of Isfahan, the central square with bazaar, mosques, and palaces around it, is still one of the world's great displays of urban architecture. The soaring, blue-tiled Shah Mosque, built in the 17th century at the orders of Shah Abbas the Great, is breathtaking. In the early 18th century, Isfahan was even more impressive than it is today, with palaces, pleasure gardens, and grand boulevards that have since vanished. One awestruck contemporary, who was there in 1716, was unable to look inside the royal palace, but judged the interior by the exterior of the great doors, which were covered with bright glass, so that they looked like immense mirrors of crystal. He saw the Shah walk in the vast maidan in front of the palace, accompanied by numbers of courtiers, dressed in cloth of gold studded with jewels, by guards on foot and on horseback, and by an elephant. He wrote that one might have thought from the courtiers' love of gold that their very flesh was made of it, but he said the courtiers did not rouse themselves to valor or virtue, nothing beyond the indulgence of pleasures. An astute young man like Nader, with simple provincial tastes, would also have quickly realized that the Shah and his court were not as impressive as their surroundings. While in Isfahan, Nader is said to have met an old fortune teller in the square and asked him about his future. The man went through his usual tricks and seemed shocked. He repeated what he had done a couple of times, and finally he bowed in front of Nader and said, You will soon be a great king, and a quarter of the kings of this world will obey you. Nader asked, Have you gone mad, or do you think you can fool me because I am a Khorasani? The old man replied, I am not lying to you. I merely beg you to treat my children kindly when you become king. I love that detail. This fable belongs to a certain sort of narrative about the youth of great men, showing that their remarkable success was faded from the beginning. But it also illustrates the expectation of the rough-cut Khorasani that the citizens of the capital would try to patronize and swindle him. 
Given his later hostile attitude to the Safavid capital and the court, it is likely that the young provincial suffered some humiliations while in Isfahan, despite the Shah's gift. One account says that Nader was rudely treated by some court officials, and that years later, when he became Shah, he had the incident reenacted as a piece of theater for the amusement of his own court. The story is interesting as an insight into Nader's self-image, again presenting him as an outsider, humiliated by sophisticates too foolish to see his superior qualities. So yeah, maybe I was wrong earlier when I said that he was a bandit too. But anyway, um, I really like that origin story. And um, I definitely recommend this book. It's been several years since I read it, but I remember it being really fascinating. And uh, Michael Axworthy also has another great history of Iran called Empire of the Mind. which I have here. And uh, this book is really fun too. So um, definitely recommend both of these. But back to Empires of the Steps. Um, I got this one from Amazon since I, it was just a brand new book. So usually can't beat the price there. Uh, sometimes when they ship it in those little bubble wrap packages, things can get damaged. But this time they shipped it in that nice stiff cardboard and it arrived in perfect condition as far as I can tell. Um, this one cost a little bit less than $30 and you know perfectly satisfied. Always nice to have a cool new history book. Um, we hope to be recording these more often. I still have a pile of books here that I need to get through and it just keeps getting bigger so um, thanks for checking out the show, and until next time, happy reading. Mm -hmm.